Off the beaten path in the rural countryside of Westmoreland County, Pennsylvania, you'll pass through one of the many patch towns left behind by the industry of previous generations. Behind the township building of one such patch lies something peculiar for present-day eyes. This is the slope entrance for the Mammoth Mines. On January 27, 1891, over 100 miners were killed in a singular blast that was one of the worst mining catastrophes in American history. In the early 2000s, Mount Pleasant Township restored the entryway and erected a monument displaying the names of all those who were killed that fateful day. One would expect that this explosion that January morning would just be the climax of a story, not the beginning. In fact, this was the start of a series of bloody events in western Pennsylvania that would affect the chain of commerce of not just Pittsburgh, but also the United States as a whole. This is the story of just one particular occurrence. This is the tale of the Morwood Massacre. The people living within the Connorsville coal field began 1891 in less than favorable conditions. A depression in the value of coke hampered a coal coke steel chain that fueled the Pittsburgh region. The Henry Clay Frick Coke Company, named after its infamous founder, was forced to shut down 20% of their operations in December of the previous year alone to match the depreciation of coke. For Frick, his fellow operators, and their employees, the timing could not have been any worse. The previously agreed upon scale of wages were set to expire at February. The recent explosion at Mammoth weighed heavily on the minds of the workers. It was an exasperation of the deplorable conditions mine and oven workers faced on a daily basis. A 1887 pay raise did little to make up for the backbreaking shifts that ran well over 10 hours, with much of said pay sucked back up by the company's store. Whatever remained went into paying for the two or three rooms on one side of a duplex, the typical living conditions of a mining family in the Connorsville coal field. Many of the workers were immigrants from Hungary and various Slavic nations, speaking little English. They took the first job offered off the boats and they had little awareness of how far they'd be stretched physically and mentally just for a ton of coal. If anyone tried to unionize for better work conditions, they'd often be kicked out of their homes and immediately replaced. On February 2nd, representatives of Connorsville Coalfield Companies met with representatives of the mine and oven workers. In previous years, an amalgamation of smaller organizing bodies would have spoken, all with different requests. On this Groundhog Day in 1891, however, the workers were represented by the recently formed United Mine Workers of America, who took a bold first step. Their demands included a reduction to an eight-hour workday, a 10% raise for most workers, a limit on housing rent, a three-day notice of firing of a worker, and extra pay compensating for working conditions. Additionally, the UMW made a push for the companies to only employ union workers. The representatives of the company expectantly rejected all the demands. Partially out of an inability to meet these demands due to the depression in the value of coke, but also of personal spite that Frick harbingered from being forced to agree to prior negotiations with the workers. The only thing the operators offered was a 7% decrease in wages. It was inevitable that a strike was going to occur. Both parties agreed mutually that a month-long shutdown of the Connorsville coal field could spike the value of coke, opening the door for future negotiations down the road. Therefore, on February 10th, the ovens in the Connorsville coal field went silent as thousands of workers walked off the job. The effects of the strike were swiftly seen as all the patch communities became devoid of life. Miners and oven workers were quickly evicted from their dwellings as soon as their money ran out. They moved to the border of company property, establishing 10 cities that covered the hillside of southwestern Pennsylvania. Here they would be supplied with rations and other basic necessities purchased by the UMW. The union, however, was still in its infancy. As such, funding for this particular strike was going to be limited. Even only a few weeks in, the strikers were experiencing the effects of funding being stretched tight. While there was reports of some violence breaking out in the southern end of the coal field, the strikers around the borough of Mount Pleasant remained relatively relaxed. The town of several thousand, with its grand main street line shops, was sandwiched by patches. Along the southwestern slope, which the borough sat on, lay one such patch, Moorwood. The mines and ovens, which the residents normally tended to, were situated in a valley. 
While owned by the McClure Coke Company, ties with Henry Clay Frick were abundant. Aside from his own company building the 600 ovens on site in the early 1880s, Frick also owned a large sum of stock with McClure. The superintendent of the operation at the time of the strike was Morris Ramsey, one of Frick's favorite operators. As a teenager, Ramsey had immigrated with his family from Scotland in 1863. The following year, he found quick employment within the mines of Westmoreland County. It didn't take long for him to be appointed as a mine boss before gaining the appointment of superintendent of the Moorwood operations in 1882. In 1887, he moved his family to the edge of the Patch community where a large Victorian home was placed on the hillside overlooking the ovens. Frick was so impressed with Ramsey's handling of Moorwood that he soon gained jurisdiction over four other coke and coal operations surrounding Mount Pleasant. Although things appeared peaceful from his porch, Ramsey was growing a bit unnerved by reports of violent clashes elsewhere in the coal field. He hoped professional armed hands would be given to him quickly if such a thing was to occur at his own works. As the strike dragged into March, both sides were becoming restless. Coke was and still is, critical in the creation of steel. Frick had predicted correctly that the value of coke would spike as a result of the strike, and he knew this because his close business partner, Andrew Carnegie, was continually writing him asking for updates on the strike. Carnegie wanted to know when the coke trains were to start running back into his own steel mills down in Pittsburgh. But Carnegie grew a little concerned when Frick already had planned out arrangements for new scale of wages without consulting the strikers. To announce terms and try to start ovens is a very serious step to take. It should be postponed until the last day possible as every day's idleness will render starting easier. I should not think of making a move this month. Cannot Lynch get some of the men to suggest a sliding scale and you offer one a compliance with the request? This is the shape to get it in, and I think Lynch could lead up to that subject and get enough of the men to base your action upon. I do not like your idea of thrusting it upon them. It would show too clearly your desire to start. Carnegie had pushed Frick to negotiate in the previous strikes in the Connorsville coal field. Frick would not bend the knee in 1891. Frick had buyers demanding coke, therefore it was simply time to turn the ovens back on, with or without the help of the strikers. On the morning of March 25, 1891, strikers at Standard Shaft would find a simple piece of paper tacked on the wall of one of the mining offices. It announced the passing of a new three-year sliding scale that would be pressed into service immediately across all operations in the Connellsville coal field, starting at just $1.75 a week. The notice also would institute a nine-hour workday, prohibit any further striking, and outlaw negotiations of union contracts. To say that the strikers were upset is an understatement. Many quickly began to cuss and shout, grabbing logs and breaking the nearest thing in sight. The new scale wages were outrageous, but the company is not even given the decency of a meeting with striking representatives in person was the last straw. Frick and the operators suspected violence would erupt when reopening began and had quietly been shuttling Pinkerton agents and other hired guns into the region. However, these guards were concentrated around the site of existing violence to the south, not Mount Pleasant. By day's end, less than a hundred strikers had returned to work in the Mount Pleasant region. Plans were underway to import strike breakers. When word reached the papers of the operator's swift response, the Connorsville Courier proclaimed, the great coke strike in lockout is broken. They would soon be proven dreadfully wrong. Morse Ramsey's operations at Moorwood became a particular target for the strikers' newfound aggression. 30 men had accepted temporary employment to help pump out water from the Moorwood mines. The picketeers were outraged, believing the McClure Coke Company were attempting to seduce exasperated strikers into agreeing to the sliding scale. Some of the striking ranks resolved the best way to stop future strike breaking was to remove the workplace from the equation. Just before daybreak on March 30th, a mob of a thousand strikers busted through the fence surrounding the Moorwood facilities. The ovens were snapped from their burn cycle as had coals were forcefully spilled out across the dirt. Larry tracks were torn off the tops of the ovens, windows in nearby buildings were smashed, and whatever was of value laying in the open became scorched on the piles of smoldering coke. Although the facility was being guarded by a small contingent of deputized civilians, Westmoreland County Sheriff Lucien Clausen held back from firing. 
At some point, Ramsey got caught in the fray and staggered back to his house with a bloodied nose. When the riot dispersed, free strikers were apprehended and taken off to the jail in the county seat of Greensburg. The early morning riots startled the residents of Mount Pleasant. Rumors spread that another assault was imminent. Clawson requested help from James A. Lohr, a dentist in Mount Pleasant who was a Civil War veteran and presently captain of Company E of the 10th Pennsylvania Regiment. Lohr messaged his adjutant general the following. The situation at the mines at Mount Pleasant is very threatening. Sheriff insists on protecting the works with my men, which cannot be done unless I am allowed to arm them. I would be in command and use proper precaution. There will be no loss of property or lives if so allowed. Lore soon received a reply that stated no word of disorder had reached National Guard High Command and that National Guard property such as firearms could only be pressed into service by order of the governor. On March 31st, Clawson wired that very request to the desk of Governor Robert Pattinson. The reply was less than what the worried sheriff was expecting. Civil power to maintain peace must be exhausted and powerless before military power can be successfully invoked. Clawson did not back down, resubmitted his request to get an even briefer response. I decline to issue order for use of arms. While law enforcement scrambled to establish their defense of Moorwood, General Manager Thomas Lynch established a new notice at the Standard Shaft to strikers from Frick's works. If necessary to break the strike, the H.C. Frick Coke Company will take a hand. We will operate our works, and if necessary, we will bring into the region uniformed men, armed and prepared for battle, and they will be ordered to shoot and shoot to kill anyone who interferes with our men and our arrangements. The Frick Coke Company is not going out with guns and clubs to drive the strikers to work, and the Frick Coke Company will not permit strikers to go out with guns and clubs to drive men who want to work away from our plants. That's our position. When citizens of Mount Pleasant awoke on April 1st, they found that the Moorwood Works were defended not only by county deputies, but also 20 members of the National Guard, led by Captain Lohr, all with firearms at the ready. By doing so, Lohr had not only violated his commander's orders, but also re-agitated the strikers. At some point in the day, the sound of a brass band could be heard echoing between the storefronts along Main Street. A small party of strikers marched to the top of the hill, carrying a straw-stuffed suit and overhauls with Lohr's name draped over the breast of the effigy. A few moments later, the effigy hung from a tree in the center of Mount Pleasant, burning. Resolve that we, the citizens of Mount Pleasant, condemn the despicable action of Captain J.A. Lohr in taking the sides with monopoly and against ill-paid labor by volunteering his and his company's services for the purpose of creating disturbances between the operators and men. As Lohr's effigy incinerated, the UMW met in Connorsville to discuss the progress of the strike. After two months, it was apparent all the demands would not be met anytime soon. The union's president, John B. Ray, declared that the strike should shift the focus upon reducing the workday to eight hours and leave the sliding scale for another fight. He felt confident the strike could hold strong through much of 1891, claiming, Our troubles have been very exaggerated. The operators themselves are wholly responsible for what difficulties may arise. The understrappers are doing all they can to provoke the men into a conflict that they may have something to go before the public with. Ray neglected to talk in detail on the Moorwood riot, pushing it off as nothing more than a few mischievous boys. Frick was slightly less brief on the matter. Our policy has been to offer as good wages as possible to the men. We have tried to make the reduction as slight as could be, yet the men, led by so-called leaders, are dissatisfied and are doing all they can to injure us. But we will not stand by quietly and see our property destroyed. As I have said, we have issued our etiquette, and that is all there is to it. The darkening of the landscape over Mount Pleasant did little to quell the uncertainty and unrest amongst the strikers. Ramsey put what remaining guards and employees he had to clean up the ovens for operation in the near future. Meanwhile, in Standard Shaft, strikers were hosting a meeting. Topics of discussion were most prominently about the 32 writs of injunction issued by Sheriff Clawson out to key labor leaders amongst the striking force. Clawson was hoping that by doing this, it would ebb any future violence. 
all it did was make the strikers more angry. Coupled with the fact that these strikers had been out of, of a home for months, had no money, were running on limited rations, they were fed up with the situation of the strike. And considering that the union were now pushing away from getting the sliding scale removed, the strikers around Mount Pleasant felt they had no choice but to demonstrate by a naked another run on Moorwood. Clawson had left the Moorwood works to the care of Deputy McConnell and Captain Lore. They had approximately 60 men at arms strategically placed throughout the region. Lookouts on horseback on Main Street, McConnell and several deputies on the porch of the company's store, Lore and his volunteer National Guardsmen at the main gate along Stonersville Road. Shortly before 9, Lore received word of a mob of 300 strikers moving from the southwest. Shortly after, word of another gang were on the move from the north. Drums could be heard echoing off the rolling hills, but it would not be until after 10 p.m. that a party of 150 strikers appeared, being led by a band of percussionists. They all had some sort of blunt instrument slung over their shoulders. The angry noises of the strikers went silent as the sight of Lore and his guards brandishing their rifles. The band continued on, remaining quiet until they got to Standard Shaft. Shortly after midnight on April 2nd, arriving groups of strikers merged into the existing party gathered around Standard Shaft. Over a thousand were in the streets, parading around with a drum and brass band while waiting for word of where they would go next. At around 2.30 a.m., the word passed through their ranks. To more wood! Two squads, numbering 500 each, began making their way through the streets of Mount Pleasant. One squad paused to sever the telegraph lines, hoping to cut any warnings to Moorwood. However, operators cowering out of sight of the strikers quickly repaired the lines as the mobs disappeared into town. Lore received the warning just as the first squad turned onto Stonersville Road, being guided by two groups of drummers. The strikers encountered McConnell, only pausing though to heckle the deputies standing along the porch. They advanced to the bottom of the hill, where Morris Ramsey's elegant home overlooked the ovens and mines he supervised. Lore stepped forward, ordering for the crowd to halt. They were now near in the company stables, just feet from the main gate, and not stopping. Lore started shouting to halt in Hungarian. Some of the strikers broke toward the fence around the ovens, where the guardsmen had their guns trained. Two volleys were fired by the deputies into the crowd. At least one striker returned fire with their pistol. The crowd dispersed, running in all directions, leaving behind a dozen of their number bleeding out in the street. Nine strikers would eventually die of gunshot wounds in what would be soon titled the Moorwood Massacre. When word of the shooting reached Frick's homestead mansion at 7.30 a.m., the Coke Baron had a short and cold response. This will likely have a good effect on the riotous element up there. When Sheriff Clawson returned to Mount Pleasant, he found it in a scene of chaos. People raced to him, spattering out bits of information about what happened in Moorwood. Captain Lore had locked himself in his own house on College Avenue, surrounding the property with guards. A rumor circulated that an angry mob was looking for Ramsey to lynch him. Clawson wired Governor Pattinson once again, requesting the use of the National Guard. Pattinson had already received word of the shooting and had not only pressed the 10th Pennsylvania Regiment to service, but was also sending the 18th Regiment to Mount Pleasant. By the end of April 3rd, nearly a thousand soldiers had descended upon Mount Pleasant. The civilians, strikers, and company officials were all uncertain of what would follow. While guardsmen held the town, strikers and company officials began to call for the arrest of individuals from either side, both trying to shift blame entirely on their adversary. Eventually, Clawson issued warrants for arrest for members of all parties. These included Captain Lore and 11 deputies for felonious shooting, Morris Ramsey and Thomas Lynch as accessories to the crime, and some 30 strikers, including several members of the musical band that marched to Moorwood. All company officials and associates bade bail, except one deputy who fled the county, but the accused deputies were quickly charged with murder. News of the shooting would eventually reach all parts of the United States by the end of the week, but the reaction was far from sympathetic toward those who had perished and the loved ones left devastated. 
To many outside the coal fields, the riotous behavior had befallen the strikers of Moorwood was confirmation of negative stereotypes of the European immigrants flocking to the nation at that time. A particularly egregious editorial ran in the New York Tribune on April 4th. This unhappy situation calls public attention to the fact that a great proportion of these people now awaiting sullenly a chance for revenge are absolutely unfit for citizenship and ought never to have been admitted into the country. They are densely ignorant, brutal by instinct, incompetent to form an intelligent, independent judgment, passionate in temperament, and submissive only to superior force. They and those like them everywhere are a constant menace to the peace of the country as they are totally incapable of comprehending its institutions. They are examples of the refuse which is pouring into the country from the old world, in a tide which is fast submerging parts of the U.S. in ignorance and stupidity. When questioned for thoughts on the shooting, Andrew Carnegie had a similar attitude. From what I can learn, the men who took part in the riot were not Americans, but nearly all Hungarians. Those have no cause for complaint that I have known for, and for they are paid five times as much money for their work as they could get in their own country. I don't think there will be any more trouble up there. The bodies of seven of the victims were set for view by a jury in Mount Pleasant to determine the particulars of the shooting. The coroner struggled to find a fair jury, or any jury for that matter. None of the deputies agreed to view the bodies and give a testimony, while many of the strikers flat out refused to meet with the coroner. The New York Tribune listed two eyewitness accounts in their April 4th paper. Albert Haley, an onlooker some hundred yards away from the scene, reported only hearing the sound of the volley of the rifles, while George Taylor, a watchman closer to the works, claimed to have heard two or three pistol rounds before the rifles erupted. The inquiry could only state that whoever fired the first shot could not be resolved. Ultimately, Captain Lohr and the charged deputies were acquitted of all charges. Fifteen of the strikers were convicted for various charges relating to the April 2nd shooting, though most of the sentences were later suspended. While the accusary editorial ran in the New York Tribune on April 4th, a train made the short run from Mount Pleasant to nearby Scottsdale, carrying seven primitive wooden caskets inside its cars. Five National Guard companies surround the train station as pallbearers carried the first ones to fall at Moorwood off the platform. At least 2,500 mourners followed the caskets through the cold and snowy afternoon, making the trek from Scottsdale to the St. John Cemetery on the western edge of town. It was here back in January many of the remains of those killed in the Mammoth Mine were interred in an unmarked grave. The slain strikers were given a similar burial. Several of the labor leaders took the time to caution the solemn crowd against any further acts of aggression. The mourners then dispersed, hoping to leave the shooting to the sands of time. Although some were still adamant in continuing the fight, the Moorwood Massacre had dealt a devastating blow to the morale of the strikers. With thousands evicted as a result of the strike, they had lost over $4 million in wages. By the end of April, state militia was replaced by Pinkerton agents hired by the coal companies. They dotted in every patch community around Mount Pleasant. Nevertheless, violence still occurred. In late April, a stick of dynamite was detonated in front of homes of strikers considering returning to work. Ramsey and Lynch were both on high alert. However, Frick was confident that the strike was nearing its conclusion. After the acquittal of Captain Lore, most of the strikers returned to their jobs. On May 25, 1891, in the, at the end of a telegraph message from Henry Clay Frick to Andrew Carnegie, there was the declaration, Coke victory complete. The Coke strike of 1891 proved to Henry Clay Frick the advantage of militant force in the face of unionization, a tactic that would become synonymous with his name. The Moorwood Massacre would be yet another ugly reminder of the great gap between rich and poor, as well as reinforcing prejudice against mine and oven workers, especially immigrants. Unions like the UMWA would walk a fine line between peace and violence in future disputes. The Moorwood Massacre set the benchmark for a chain of labor violence that would plague the rest of the decade. On July 6, 1892, steel workers of Pickerton agents would engage in a gunfight over control of the Carnegie Homestead Steel Plant. In 1894, a nationwide coal strike would see five strikers be gunned down in Uniontown, PA. In 1910, Westmoreland County would be gripped by a 16-month strike in which multiple people were assaulted and murdered. 
all of which was just in western Pennsylvania alone, as disputes pertaining to the coal coke steel connection of commerce would erupt across the United States in future decades. Many wanted to put the Moorwood Massacre behind them. One that could not, however, was Morris Ramsey. He'd been continually tense through the entire strike and began to grow sick. Frick advised for the superintendent to get away from the stress of work, vacationing in his native land of Scotland for several weeks in September of 1891. However, his condition continued to deteriorate, being diagnosed with pancreatic cancer, complications which he died from on December 29, 1892. Today, several buildings in Mount Pleasant area retain his name. Captain Lohr would wipe his record clean of the shooting, taking command of Company E during the Spanish-American War, participating in conflict, and adding to his prestigious military career. The Moorwood Mines and Ovens would eventually be bought out by the H.E. Frick Company in 1903 and continued to operate into the 1920s. One by one, the ovens went cold as the new century progressed, as steel mills found newer ways to produce coke. Eventually, steel mills themselves would be exported to other parts of the world for the very thing the 1891 strike tried to stop, the cheapest means of production. Much of the countryside began to return to its former glory as nature gradually claimed the works. Reclamation would do the rest of the work. By the end of the 20th century, the Moorwood ruins had been paved over by the freeway of Route 119. The patch itself was consumed by the expansion of Mount Pleasant. Ramsey's home remains as the most identifiable of what once was here. In 2000, the state of Pennsylvania erected a historical marker along Stonersville Road, now Route 981. A brief summary of what transpired in the early morning hours of April 2nd, 1891 is etched on both sides. Someone has sent some blades in the logo of the UMWA on the post. The PA Labor History Society erected their own monument. The names of all nine victims of the Moorwood Massacre are etched in a rock slab at the foot of the state marker. If you take Route 91 beyond Mount Pleasant through Scottsdale, you will come to a sharp turn surrounded by graves. A state marker tells the tale of the hundred miners killed at the Mammoth Mine. If one takes a stroll through the older graves, you will find a large, seemingly empty corner. Two modest grave markers note the locations of the miners' large grave and the massacre's smaller common plot. Both were installed by the PA Labor History Society in 2000, at last recognizing the sacrifices made by the common mine and oven worker in the year of 1891. Thank you.